Good morning here in the US, good afternoon in Africa. Welcome to Open Classroom in Africa Speaks. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. So delighted to welcome you to today's program. So using the Zoom webinar as we are, um, for our audience, you all are muted. We can't see or hear you, but there will be time in today's presentation for your questions. So I wanna encourage folks to use the chat um, throughout the presentation, we'll make notes of any questions or comments that you have. Also want to extend a welcome to anybody joining us on YouTube. We do not have a way to moderate chat through YouTube, though. So before we get started, I just want to let you know a couple of things we have coming up. There's two programs in Open Classroom next week. On Tuesday, August the 24th, Beth Brawley is going to speak to us about fear of needles and the unknown, compassionately addressing vaccine hesitancy. So that program is going to be about the COVID vaccination and people for whom phobia is a reason that they're having um, a trouble accessing the vaccine. And then on Wednesday, August 25th, we're having a program called A Vital Element of Public Safety, Social Workers for St. Louis. St. Louis Mayor Tashora Jones and Deputy Director of the St. Louis Mental Health Board, uh, Serena Muhammad are gonna be joined by Dean Mary McKay and Professor Sean Joe talking about Mayor Jones's administration and a new initiative to fund more social workers here in St. Louis. So you definitely want to check that out if you're local and interested in that topic. Both of those programs are 1230 Central. But um, today we're kicking off our Africa Speaks series that's sponsored by the Africa Initiative here at Washington University. And here to share more and launch the program, please join me in welcoming Vice Chancellor for International Affairs, Kurt Dirks. Well, welcome to everyone, whether you are in uh, St. Louis, Africa, or somewhere uh, in between. Uh, we are uh, really excited to kick off uh, this academic year uh, with Karen's presentation and Africa Speaks. Let me do a very quick um, background for um, uh, you on the Africa Initiative and Africa Speaks. Uh, about three years ago, uh, we launched the Washington University launched the Africa Initiative to uh, promote uh, collaborative research uh, between uh, Washington University faculty and Africa, uh, to promote uh, educational opportunities for our WashU students, and to also create opportunities for students from Africa to come and study at Washington University. And uh, I think we've had great success with that, in part because we have actually so many faculty uh, who are doing work on the continent. Um, and uh, the, the Africa Initiative is currently um, uh, uh, managed by a, a faculty steering committee, in fact, which comprise, is comprised of faculty from across the entire Washington University uh, campus. And uh, Dr. Bill Powderly and, and I co-chair that. Two years ago, uh, in other words, in the fall of 2019, as one of those uh, uh, activities, we launched uh, Africa Speaks. And at that point, it was a set of inform informal conversations with WashU faculty to talk about the you know, work that they had going on uh, in Africa. This year, however, uh, we decided to take a different tact, <clears throat> and that is to spotlight research, excuse me, <clears throat> research and scholarly activity going on uh, by our collaborating colleagues uh, on the continent. And so to do this, what we uh, did was ask uh, WashU faculty to nominate their uh, uh, collaborators to, uh, to come and uh, talk to us so that we could learn from them, so we could learn about the opportunities and uh, uh, hear uh, you know, about what we might do going forward. So we, uh, we're very excited to have uh, six of those uh, this fall. The next one is in October, and then we have um, uh, uh, ones in November and December. And so uh, each one of those is gonna feature a different person um, uh, on the continent that's gonna represent a wide variety uh, of, uh, of different research um, uh, collaborations going on. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it to our, uh, our first WashU faculty, uh, Professor uh, Manu uh, Guayal, who is um, uh, a neuroradiologist in the Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology, and he's a faculty member in radiology and uh, neurology. So Manu, thank you for helping to, uh, to get us kicked off today, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Kurt. Um, it's really my pleasure 
um, to be here today and to have a chance to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Karen Katkudi. Uh, she, Karen began her life in Malta, where she also completed her medical education and early training. And then she completed training in radiology in the UK and subspecialized in pediatric radiology in Melbourne and again in the UK. And over the past few years, she's had this remarkable career so far in many different countries, Malawi, Bonaire, Aruba, Spain, um, before returning back last year to Malawi, which we'll hear more about in her talk. She is currently a consultant radiologist and a radiology lecturer with an appointment at the Kamuzu University of Health Sciences in Blantyre, Malawi. And she has retained roles with Doctors Without Borders, as well as the World Federation of Pediatric Imaging. And she's currently the lead of the Malawi Project for Worldwide Radiology, which is a non-government organization. Um, and she's, of course, also a member of various uh, radiology societies. Now, I met Karen uh, first through the Blantyre Malaria Project, which is a project that's being led uh, by Dr. Terry Taylor from Michigan State University. Um, and this project, for those who may not be familiar with it, has made several important advances in malaria research over the years. And in particular, has recently identified really critical brain MRI findings in children with cerebral malaria. And this has led to clinical trials that Karen and I are both part of. Um, and we're part of this really fun group of radiologists that's uh, studying and evaluating these brain MRIs in children. So it's been really wonderful working with her. She's clearly an exceptionally skillful radiologist, very dedicated to her patients. You know, we often take radiology for granted here, I think, in the United States, but it's historically been revolutionary for medicine and continues to enable life-saving treatments for many patients, including stroke, trauma, and infections in many, in many areas. So as healthcare systems improve, uh, investment in radiology is critical, but really challenging to implement. And I think uh, Karen's work is especially important because not only is she providing an essential care for her patients, but she's laying the foundation uh, for radiology, which will impact patients far beyond um, her own. So without further delay, let me turn it over to her so that she can begin her talk. Thank you very, thank you very much, Manu, for that introduction. And um, thank you very much to Washington University's Africa Speak series um, for the invite. Um, so today I'm here to share with you my experiences as a radiologist in Malawi, where the warm heart of Africa, as it is affectionately known, so receiving this email was really quite a life-changing experience or point for me and my family. Um, of course, I had been in the country before in Malawi, but for me, this was my first formal post of employment in the country. Several months of planning later, we found ourselves at the airport traveling lightly, as you can see, and soon after we're soaring above the bauxite laden red earth that is so commonly seen in Malawi. For those who have not yet visited Malawi, um, Malawi is a landlocked country bordered by Mozambique, Tanzania and Zambia. And Lake Malawi forms part of the vertical border with Mozambique and Tanzania. And the mountains dot the terrain, um, most notably Mulanje Mountain, which is the highest point of Malawi at 3,002 meters at its peak. So Malawi is clearly adorned with not only an array of beautiful flora and vegetables, fruits and fauna, which are so intriguing, but also with people who have given Malawi its name of the warm heart of Africa. And what I wish to do in this presentation is to share with you four lessons or observations, shall we say, of my, exper my experience in Malawi that actually I think can be translated to every other low re resource setting or global health assignment anyone were to undertake. And I think to me, the first important lesson, generally speaking, was to watch, listen, and learn. I think that when one moves from a so-called high resource setting to a lower resource setting, it's all too tempting to sometimes jump straight into the new lower income setting with ideas of change, ideas of improvement. 
But one valuable lesson I learn on a day to day basis is the importance of watching, listening, and learning about the cultural diversities, the background behind present day scenarios, workflows, current state of affairs, epidemiology. I think adopting this approach really enables one to fully understand the context and thus be more valuable in collaborative approaches. So Malawi's population is booming. A population of almost 3 million in the 1950s is inflated to a population of a little over 18 million in 2018. So a rate increase of about 672,000 people per year at a rate of approximately 2.6% per year. TB is a major public health problem in this rapidly growing population and in the progressively increasing dense urban populations in particular. Households are generally consisted of a family of about four and a half people, the statistics say. Anecdotally, I think this is often much larger and it is often a very confined space. Results from a national TB prevalence survey completed in 2014 showed a higher TB prevalence of actually 1,014 per 100,000 compared to the previous estimated prevalence of 373 per 100,000 by the World Health Organization. And furthermore, MDR-TB, multi-drug resistant TB, is an emerging issue in Malawi with a prevalence of 0.4% among newly infected and 4.8% among previously treated TB patient populations respectively. HIV remains the most important risk factor for developing active TB disease in Malawi. 52% of people with TB are also infected with HIV. And despite impressive progress with regards to Malawi's battle against HIV AIDS, Malawi remains to have one of the highest HIV prevalences in the world. With one third of all new HIV infections in Malawi in 2018, reported as being in the 15 to 24 year age group. And Malawi's HIV epidemic is generalized. It affects the general population as well as certain high risk groups. In practice, this explains why anyone moving to such a context, whatever the role, must be fully in tune with the presentations and appearances of these diseases. Now, in 2014, UN AIDS set out new targets for reducing HIV by 2020, and they call this the 1990-90 rule. And Malawi is actually doing quite well with regards to hitting these targets. These are estimates taken from 2020. So I think understanding the general global direction of where we want to go with HIV AIDS, understanding the TB HIV prevalence in Malawi is just so important because essentially it is our bread and butter of clinical work over here, PCP, Kaposi sarcoma, um, cerebral neurotoxoplasmosis. We see these all the time, unfortunately. So moving on to another different subset of diseases or conditions that we see in Malawi relates to road safety or road traffic accidents, shall we say. In August 2020, the UN General Assembly proclaimed the decade of action for road safety. So they set the ambitious target of preventing at least half of road traffic accident deaths and injuries by 2030. Bearing in mind that worldwide, it is said that about 90% of road traffic accidents occur in lower middle and income countries. So such pictures of complex facial and brain injuries are pretty commonplace in our setting, making it often feel like a trauma center I previously worked in. The numbers are staggering, and so unfortunately are the fatalities. And this is often due to the high speed nature of the road traffic accidents in this place, um, and sometimes also contributed to by poor infrastructure like poor lighting in the streets at night. So carrying on with the theme of what I think is really important to understand the, the reasons for trends observed in clinical practice is the knowledge that Many people's livelihoods in Malawi are focused around Lake Malawi. And schistosomiasis is a silent danger lurking in these waters that affects the human body and which we see all the time, dependent on where our patients are geographically placed or functioning. 
occupations in the sector of agriculture in the sector of agriculture make up the bulk of employment opportunities in Malawi. Yet, for example, mining um, still occurs in Malawi, and this often translates into commonly seen occupational lung diseases and malignancies in the case profile we see daily. So other facts, um, mid-October to mid-December is a much loved season. It's mango season and people everywhere are attempting to get hold of these fruits. Adults often with a stick, children often climbing trees to, to get hold of these fruits. And that then starts to explain the pandemic of supercondylar fractures in our emergency rooms. And I find this so important. I think it's just so important to understand why are these trends happening in our hospitals. Sticking to culinary delights also paves the way to the subject of non-communicable diseases in Malawi, something which is increasingly prevalent in this population. And something which is associated with with statistics such as this, one in three of Malawians aged 25 to 64 have hypertension. And this fact, this um, knowledge then translates into what we see also unfortunately pretty frequently, young patients with intracerebral hemorrhages. Um, so moving on to perhaps another of our large patient categories here is of course the oncology sector and I find the tumor type differences between different settings fascinating. There are many published papers describing this in the literature and this is one emerging from the hospital I operate in um, which highlights the prevalence of Burkitt's lymphoma in our pediatric population, a disease considered endemic in parts of Africa with risk factors including HIV AIDS infected patients. So it makes sense. Now, there are also some diseases which are universal, we can say globally children, for example, ingest foreign bodies. But what is striking when operating in a setting like Malawi is the different appearances um, such a common event can have. And this is due to the phenomenon of del delayed presentations in Malawi. Here, a boy who ingested a battery which lodged in his upper food pipe in his esophagus, subsequently developing a diverticular delayed presentation of a very commonly encountered um, phenomenon globally. And delayed pre patient presentation is very common and multifactorial here. This is a patient who presented very delayed with a huge back rhabdomyosarcoma. And delayed presentations are often due to social reasons of either patients not being able to afford to leave their family or jobs to take their children to hospital, or the significant proportion of the population who turn to traditional healers. I think those are the two most commonly encountered scenarios to explain this. And knowing this fact, appreciating this cultural diversity suddenly makes one understand the context of the clinical situation and appearances such as these skin markings when presented with them in a the clinic. So the country is watching all of this. The world is noting, analyzing, and I think for me, lesson two for any global health worker from my experience is that we need to understand what the national and international global health strategies are. I think whatever discipline we come from, we need to keep abreast with the goals, the targets, the strategies set for the world, for lower and middle income countries, for the country we're operating in, whatever our interests, whether that's clinical or research, I think by by adopting this strategy, by being aware of all of these initiatives, we can then align our work, our own professional targets with a more meaningful um, scope to them. But practically, how does all of this happen? And so then how do you assimilate and apply all of this to our own individual work, whatever that may be? And so then I can introduce you to my context um, as a radiologist in in Malawi and my, I'm located at the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi, a very large city um, in Malawi. It's a large teaching hospital, the largest tertiary health facility in Malawi actually. It is said to have 1,350 beds, but in reality, the number of inpatients exceeds this at any one time. And I think binding all we've said to now all together, we've got a population of at least 18 and a half million, 
with currently three fully qualified full-time radiology consultants in the country. So this equates to 0.16 of a radiologist per 1 million population as compared to the UK where there are 48 per 1 million as compared to the US where there are 100 per 1 million. So gross shortage of radiology expertise in country. And this gross radiologist expertise paucity contributes to the current gross inequity in our healthcare delivery in country. The 3.8 SDG relates to universal health coverage being severely breached at the moment in Malawi. One of the action points of this SDG relates to this issue and to the fact that capacity building in country is a priority. And therefore knowing what the global target is, what the situation is on the ground, then that's when I believe we can collaborate and how we should align our efforts as global health workers. So um, at the moment, there is a strong collaborative, collaborative effort between the college which employs me um, and the University of Bergen, as well as other partners besides our Norwegian collaborators. And we are currently working on the creation of a postgraduate radiologist program to home grow Malawian radiologists. The program is scheduled to start in March, 2022. We are starting small and enrolling two radiology trainees per year, but we are really aiming to deliver this ambitious deliverable um, and to provide high quality level education. The project is currently on track and considered a win at this stage, increasing radiologist capacity. That's the first big um, impact we hope to have. And then the actual radiology department is comprised of a team of 17 radiographers and sonography technicians, one radiology intern and myself as the radiology consultant. We x-ray approximately 150 patients per day, ultrasound scan approximately 40 per day, and scan with CT approximately 18 patients per day. Given the ease of donation and the, and the recognized huge advantage of portable ultrasounds, almost every hospital department you'll find has at least one of such scanners there. And point of care ultrasound for those who are not very familiar has been recognized as a hugely important skill to disseminate in our setting in particular. It empowers the clinician at the bedside to answer specific clinical questions with a yes or a no, a binary answer, thereby influencing patient management at the bedside, expediting treatment, which can be a huge problem here. It also offloads clinical cases which are relatively simple to scan, such as is there a pleural effusion, yes or no? Is there hydrocephalus? So we're task shifting from a very busy short staff radiology department to the empowered clinician at the bedside um, to answer such simple questions in such easily taught ultrasound protocols. So really knowing this, knowing that we need to be adopting this strategy to benefit our patients, this is the second biggest task I was assigned in my position, point of care ultrasound education and dissemination. And again, this cannot be done solo and is being currently worked on in collaboration with the University of Hamburg. We are building up, disseminating a structured curriculum integrated format um, with work currently being done on high quality quality assurance programs, CPD, which is often lacking when you hear about other POCUS programs. And so this year we will train 26 trainees within the hospital. And next year we hope to go out into the districts to make this accessible and to teach trainees out in the districts as well. They are the first point of call, often the first point of contact with patients and it will have a huge impact, which we cannot wait to explore, analyze and then report to you another win. So there are many other activities, including educational um, teaching within our department, work on quality, management. And here, for example, is Esther Banda, our lead CT nurse, educating the CT group on the management of post-contrast anaphylaxis. And then we've got Joseph Coletti here, a fantastic radiographer training the wider group on pediatric abdominal ultrasound imaging. So 
there are a lot of background efforts at tightening up workflows, trying to eliminate efficiencies in a challenging environment, maximizing efficiency, focusing on patient safety, high quality audit, a lot of background and awareness being done on this as well. Now, the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital is just five minutes away from the Kamuzu University of Health Sciences. CUHES, as it's shortly called, was form formerly until recently known as the College of Medicine of Malawi. And the output from CUHES is healthcare affiliates of all disciplines for service in all of Malawi. Um, and ensuring high quality radiology education integrated into structured curricula of other non-radiology curricula is also something which um, is now being focused on. As you can see, both of these lectures are being delivered remotely. Remote collaborators are helping to deliver high quality education. Again, stressing on the importance and the vitalness of, um, of collaborations to make these opportunities happen. Of course, a lot of bedside teaching also takes place daily. Now, Queen's, as it is known, is really quite blessed to be affiliated with many worldwide renowned research groups, which are geographically so close. They're basically on the Queen's campus. And this is hugely valuable to our trainees who cross paths with high quality researchers through their involvement in journal clubs, collaboration in small research projects, as well as voluntary lecturing from visiting or permanent researchers on site. And these sorts of research links are also valuable as they open doors for many Malawian healthcare affiliates to learning cutting edge technology. So for example, malaria is still a huge problem in Malawi, despite dramatically reduced numbers due to strong public interventions, public health measures. And cerebral malaria in children often carries a very poor prognosis and is a disease which has been studied by the Blantyre Malaria Project for years on site at the Queen's uh, University Central Hospital. So through the presence of this group at Queen's, besides all of the very important research work which we are cur currently doing, there are other skills and other gems which come out of this collaborative and that's our staff learning transcranial Dopplers, our hospital getting a portable MRI scanner, the first of its kind in sub-Saharan Africa. So besides allowing us, besides the collaborative allowing such great results with regards to research, it's also greatly enhancing educational opportunities and, and just ongoing CPD for our doctors over here. Highly beneficial. So with um, all our wins, obviously also come the challenges and our wins would be, we're getting the hardware, we're getting the educational opportunities through collaborations. We have good global networks to enable these projects to happen, but everything comes at a cost. And that's the biggest challenge we have. Cost um, is very hard to handle. Um, and is often necessary to make a lot of things happen over here. Internet connection is often a huge challenge. So remotely led projects, teaching activities are often hugely challenged by this, by the infrastructure. We are obviously, as we're saying, relying hugely on collaborations to enable a lot of projects happen. We are still growing capacity building. So that can sometimes be a challenge. Our infrastructure, water, electricity, and sometimes impedes our activities. And of course, COVID has hit us as well and has deferred or impacted on some of the challenges we face. So I think, I think it is impressive that whatever is gained in a low income setting is gained given all of these challenges which we far too often take so for, so for granted in higher income settings that we're also used to. So what have I learned? And I think a lesson in learning for me is if you don't have a doll, you make one out of a stick and scraps of material. If you don't have a swing, you create one out of an old tire. I think the innovativeness, the lateral thinking, the originality and the creativity in this place is truly inspiring. And I feel like there is a lot 
we have to learn from the challenges which are quite unique to settings like this and um, the tenacity is really quite incredible and i think i cannot i could not stress even more than i have done i hope the fact that all of these projects cannot be done in solo we rely and we thrive on collaborations whether that's for service provision, education, research projects. It, we have a lot to learn over here, but also we have a lot to share. Our education, our opportunities here, our exposure is really quite unique. And um, I think um, this, is just, this is just incredible and something which we are constantly very thankful for. And I think finally, it is, all too fair to say that our patients are also, you know, are, are integral to this teamwork and, uh, and, you know, are obviously the focus of everything that we do. And we are ever so grateful to be given all the opportunities that we are given. And that actually brings me to an end um, for my talk. I hope that was informative and gave you a little flavor of what life is like here experiences which i've um, gone through and lessons i've learned which i think can be translated to whatever discipline whatever specialty you are in and um, and i welcome any questions thank you that was great karen um really really exceptional work and a wonderful talk and i'm going to make sure my trainees get a chance to look at it on YouTube. Um, we are open now for questions and I think the easiest way is for folks to post it uh, on the chat and then I can repeat the question to Karen. Um, I might start by asking you a couple of questions if you have, uh, if you have a moment. Um, one is, so previously you had done volunteer work in Malawi and now you're doing paid work. How? Has your experience been different in the in the two respects? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I should say that my one year volunteering stint before coming out here was, I think, um, vital for me to first of all understand that this was my passion. This was exactly what I wanted to do, and it also allowed me to lay strong ground foundations, professional relationships with the various. Um, specialties, understanding exactly what is happening within radiology. Mm -hmm. I was always told that if you want to learn a language, you should fully immerse yourself in the country and then learn the language. And that's how I see global health and um, radiology. So I think now being back in a paid position, I think gives one perhaps more confidence um, when collaborating in a team. Of course, you're welcome both as a volunteer or a paid employee, but I think your focuses, your deliverables are tighter, you have a job description and um, targets you need to achieve. So I think that is probably what I feel is different, but why I also think a volunteering stint really enabled me to function better in a paid position. It looks like we have a couple questions coming in. <clears throat> Phil asked, we frequently have medical students interested in international experiences. Um, do you host or mentor medical students from programs that are not already affiliated with Malawi? And I will expand that by asking, do you get residents from radiology programs in the United States or yeah. elsewhere visiting? Yeah, so we actually get quite a lot of residents in every specialty, whether it's surgery, medicine, pediatrics. And that's of course usually created via a link with the various heads of departments and um, that has slowed down because of covid but it is in principle and generally very much welcomed um, as um, as a concept so we do often get a lot of medical students within radiology we haven't had any yet just because we have such a paucity of radiologists up until now mm. Um, but I, I would, I will be championing that um, for the radiology specialty itself. So I would welcome anyone interested to approach me. Great, great. <clears throat> Another question from Carolyn. 
how do you deal with maintenance of radiology machines and technology and the supplies required to run them? Um, and I have found, she has found this often a challenge in settings that seem not to have recurrent funding for those particular costs, even when they have the machines. I think it's a really yeah. relevant question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that probably falls into maybe two categories. One is um, a lot, well, some machines are donated by the Ministry of Health, of course, some are, don are donated by NGOs, researchers. And I think what is very important for donors, as well as the receivers, is to ensure that the complete life cycle of that particular hardware journey is completed. It is just not a matter of donating the material, but also looking, is there a maintenance contract? What are the ties? Are we buying the right brand for the country? Is it well represented within the country? Um, so I think from my experience, that is often one one rate limiting step or shortfall that the whole life cycle of hardware is not thought of. I think there is the challenge of funding, keeping up with um, expendables. I think that is a huge problem here. So for example, we're running the CT machine and we'll run out of syringe pumps for the injector mm. pump out of contrast. And um, that sometimes is due to the the location that we're at, that there just isn't enough stock in country, that for some reason the suppliers don't have um, such a, an efficient workflow with other countries providing this, the, the, the um, expendables to us. So I think it's a multifaceted challenge. And I think um, one way in which we are trying to address that is by making donors aware sometimes that we do need to sort of um, include the entire life cycle or, or plan for it or strategize for it, what is going to happen in 2024 when the funding runs out and thinking in advance. Um, educational initiatives and um, close ties with our higher management team over here um, to explain exactly why we need so much contrast we have a lot of trauma, contrast is necessary for scans. This is why we need it. And then all of a sudden channels become perhaps a little bit easier mm. with regards to ordering, stock taking. Um, so I think it's awareness, education, and just being aware or knowledgeable of the entire life cycle of a product. You know, I know you and I have been working quite a bit with this portable MRI machine and in, in I would love to hear your thoughts on your experience with that beyond our work in malaria. Um, yeah. One of the things I have noticed though is that a big struggle that we have is with the internet connectivity, just being able to see the images or download the images has been a struggle. So I, I'm yeah. curious as to your experiences and thoughts about this new portable MRI machine there. Yeah. So I think we're obviously very lucky to have it here, of course, for our research work and because um, uh, it is benefiting those few clinical patients that we sometimes can scan on the, the scanner to give us a vague or a gross idea without having to send them mm -hmm. all the way to the capital city, which is a four hour drive for an MRI scanner or an MRI scan. As you said, the infrastructure problems are huge. Um, not only the internet connection, but even electricity. It is not um, uncommon for the lights to go out in a hospital. Of course, there are generators and it comes back on pretty quickly usually, but it is a real problem. And one you would not think would happen in a domestic scenario in the high resource, let alone in a healthcare facility. Um, so with that comes the specific scenarios of knowing how to build a tender loving care package for something like a portable MRI, but tailor-made to an African setting, thinking about UPSs, thinking about um, how to avoid, therefore, these electrical fluctuations to avoid damage. And so I think this is something which can be applied to many things, but you just cannot translate something from a higher income setting to a lower income setting. It's just like you cannot say children are little adults. They're completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that is another lesson I have learned in global health, that 
you need to have the global, that person on the ground with the experience, the knowledge of the strong points, the weak points, and then tailor making a package like for a portable MRI and for a context which is so different like our own here. You know, that's, that's a really fascinating point, right? Uh, because there is so much technology development where the money is, right? Where we have very high resources in our high income countries. But some of the products that are needed, such as you had mentioned these outlying rural areas where you're performing point of care ultrasound. And I actually want to hear more about that too and what your mm -hmm. thoughts are on that program and where you plan to take that. But that mm -hmm. requires a different type of technology and a different way of thinking about what the mm -hmm. right technology would be. Your Absolutely. thoughts on, on that, yeah. Yeah. So any quality assurance program, you know, whether you are placed centrally or whether you're a trainees in the district would rely on image uploads to a cloud for mm -hmm. someone with the expertise who probably at the moment is located abroad to access that, to be able to then give feedback. Mm -hmm. And it's even just that simple fact or scenario of having the money to avoid that internet connection to do that from your device. Mm -hmm or even being able to find a place with a strong enough bandwidth to do that. So a lot of machines which have been made for places like Africa, but which I sometimes still feel we need to truly sit down, think, do a pilot project, apply it in the districts to really understand what is going to be the barrier there. If you had a wish list for kind of a, a infrastructure improvement or a new technology item, what would be at the top of that wish list? That's a difficult one. I think, to be honest, and maybe this is partly because I am called an optimist sometimes, I think my wish list is for us to continue the trajectory that we're applying or on at the moment. I think we're going onwards, we're going upwards. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and motivation over here. And I think once that remains and the opportunities keep coming, then the wish list will reveal itself and will come. I think it is nice that we have very good relations and understanding between the Ministry of Health and between the educational institutions and everything seems to be in harmony. Of course, there are stumbles along the way. There are everywhere. Um, but I think my wish list, rather than for an item, would be for us to continue with the same attitude and the same positive flow as we are going now. Because even from 2017 to now, I have seen a lot of positive changes, mostly in the form of opportunities. I think those are the richest changes. And I think this is what the country needs, in my humble opinion. So and that's, that's great, that's wonderful. Um, you had mentioned the Ministry of Health and you earlier mentioned that you have a, a team of radiographers. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, your, the team that you get to work with in the hospital and also maybe across Blantyre and in Malawi in general? Yeah, so in, in Blantyre, there is one major hospital, which is the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital and then, there are a couple of other private healthcare facilities, mm. um, one of which owns a CT scan, for example, and another which is um, about to install an MRI scanner. So it's diverse. Um, uh, the group I work with, so the 17 radiographers, sonographer technicians, some have been trained overseas in, for example, sonography and radiography, while Others are more akin to the clinical officer group, we call it over here. Um, I think we are not at a stage at which we have subspecialty interests yet. I think mm -hmm. as a department, we are generalists, whether it's from the radiographer or the radiology intern. Obviously, I, can, I cannot speak for any other radiologist yet. Um, we all have... Um, yeah, what I was going to say, we all um, operate daily and obviously are different functions. And um, there are upcoming opportunities for also radiographers to develop interests. Um, but I think the way we work at the moment is very closely with each other in a gener generalist way and 
we are now trying to integrate or reach out and build up some sort of unity with the, the further radiologist um, community outside of Blantyre. So liaising with our um, colleagues in Longwe in the capital city, they also have a CT scanner. So sharing um, notes on how to tackle challenges with regards to the CT scanner. Um, we want to start building more collaborative work with regards to quality, for example, standardizing and um, creating national benchmarking um, and key performance indicator strategies. So I think um, at the moment we're still quite nuclear and just functioning mostly as a Blantyre radiologist family in a generalist way. Mm -hmm. But I think the way in which we wish to grow is to network further with the other facilities in Malawi and then to hopefully all develop some sort of area of specialties just to really develop that high quality input into our work daily. You know, one of the things obviously that we've learned from the pandemic is emergent infection, infectious diseases. But in Malawi, you had mentioned a really high prevalence obviously of HIV and TB and all these other illnesses. But first of all, from a personal standpoint, how did you find yourself learning about all of these additional diseases that you may not have been as exposed to during your training? Um, I did spend a lot of time watching, listening, and learning. Even I went on some war drums. I mean, I have not done internal medicine in a long time, but I did go on war drums because I wanted to get a feel of what the true diseases are, who are my customers going to be, um, what sort of management should I propose at the end of my report that is dependent on what is available in the wards. Um, so I think um, doing that is definitely what gave me a flavor of how to learn these diseases. Of course, a lot of self-directed study. Um, uh, and presenting um, at conferences, doing research, working with researchers on publications. Um, but I think for me, the most important was to literally find myself in a room where I did not speak the language and then try to assimilate it from all the little tips, tricks and information I was getting, and then go home and really look up those specific diseases, the context within all of these strategies to understand where they fell into place um, and just really organizing my thoughts in that way. Mm -hmm. And if, if I may ask, on a more personal note, how's this been for your family and your young children? It's been great. My uh, partner is also um, a healthcare professional. He had lived here for four years, so it wasn't difficult for him to integrate. And mm -hmm. for my two-year-old, it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, it's a very easy place to live in. Um, people are very friendly, most speak English. Um, the schooling system is great um, and the outdoor life is, is also fantastic. And I think for us all, it's been, besides a professional journey, also a strong personal journey mm -hmm. where we have learned besides lessons in HIV and TB, also lessons about life. And I think that is also invaluable and something I would recommend to everybody. Um, it is a very humbling experience, but one which is tremendously fun. Um, a question came up about COVID. Um, obviously, in my understanding is Malawi is unfortunately currently experiencing a surge in COVID cases, and, but vaccines are now available. What is the situation there? And how did you personally and your healthcare team um, get the vaccine and have seen a lot of vaccine hesitancy and so forth. Yeah, so we were lucky to have given a COVAX consignment of uh, vaccinations and most of us healthcare workers were offered our first vaccine in January, so quite a while ago and not too out of sync with the rest of the world, I think. Um, living here through a, pan an ep a pandemic is really an interesting time. Um, I think that's where the whole creativity, lateral thinking comes in a little bit with having to make do with not 
all the hardware that everyone else in the world has to treat this disease. So I think that is was very eye opening for me. I think the inequity of care was also very stark, not having enough, hardly enough ventilators. Um, so I think that was also pretty striking to me. And I think the, the impact on the population and how they perceived COVID was also very interesting to me. So the fear of coming to hospital because they would contract COVID and therefore mm -hmm. their original complaint would suffer because of that. Um, and I think, of course, we have the statistics to help us understand the scenario better, but often it's so hard to understand the true picture, what is really happening in the districts, the villages. Is the mortality really refl a true reflection of? Um, so for me, this pandemic has been a multifaceted kind of eye opener um, from many positions as a doctor, as a friend of someone who has contracted disease, as a spectator, as you know, someone who's kind of watching everything around. Um, so it has been quite a journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Looks like we're almost up with time. Um, just one last question for you, from me. Um, have you already made plans for your next step, or do you know where you're going to be a year or two years from now? Yeah. So um, my contract is up um, for renewal next year. So mm -hmm. in the next year, what we'll do now is we'll start the postgraduate radiology program in March, and roll our first two radiology trainees. Um, we'll keep organizing point of care ultrasound courses, education, QA centrally, but my next target is to disseminate out into the districts. And for that, we'll have to do a fresh needs assessment, scientific analysis of what skills will truly impact the districts, which will be very different to the central focus educator, education um, programs we're doing. So I think um, for me, um, that is kind of my educational role and two biggest targets or deliverables I'll be working on. Of course, research forms is another passion of mine. So keeping up ties with the Blantyre Malaria Project and several other research institutions here. Um, and that obviously we'll, we'll only get to know what exciting research questions we have as we go along. But I think for me, it's keeping a a diverse interest with the balance of service provision, education, research, and management. I think those are the four hats I like to wear and um, the way I'll be organizing my thoughts. That's wonderful. Great. Well, thank you both so much, Karen. I, I so appreciate all the beautiful imagery and the storytelling, it, it did make me feel um, like I have a, a sense of what this very important work that you're doing um, is. And I also really um, loved hearing you speak about the people that you're serving and the uh, respect and affection that you have for the resiliency and the creativity that you see around you. Um, it's really wonderful. Uh, Mindy, thank you so much for just an artful job facilitating the Q&A. Uh, this has been just a really beautiful way of starting our Africa Speaks series. Uh, so I am I'm very grateful to you both and to the audience for chiming in with their questions. Um, anyway, we will bring our, our first program of, of the six in the series to a close now. There are five more coming between now and the end of the year. Registration is open on the Open Classroom website, and we would certainly love to have folks uh, chime in as we're hearing from other countries and other collaborators um, with Washington University faculty and, and folks on the African continent. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all very much. Have a good rest of your day, whether it's wrapping or just getting started, and, and please do help, stay healthy and safe out there. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.